20 years ago, Super Mario Sunshine was released, which means Flood is just months away from being able to refill at Corona Mountain. This was one of the first games I ever played. Super Mario Sunshine was my first video game love. I grew up in Nintendo's GameCube era, the special time where they could just pop out a couple Pikmin games back to back, Metroid Primes, F-Zeros, Star Foxes, Zeldas. Even though it was one of the company's historic lows and the PS2 was firmly at the top, it was a time of unprecedented Nintendo-ness that produced games we would never see today. It was only later in life I found out that Sunshine is generally considered the worst 3D Mario. I played through it again semi-recently to see how it held up, and I still loved it. Is it my favorite 3D Mario? Yeah, I'm allowed to be wrong sometimes. Is it the best 3D Mario? Is it the most Mario Mario? Absolutely not, but it is the most Splatoon Mario. This is a game that was so early in its own franchise, but still managed to feel like a dramatic formula shift. Everything takes place on a summer vacation of Archipelago. Mario becomes a victim of the criminal justice system, Bowser has a kid and speaks real dialogue. Now who's gonna stop me? And most importantly, I am Flood, a flash liquidizer ultra dousing device. I hope to be of assistance. Some of the stuff in Mario Sunshine was foundational to my growth as a person. This game planted into me a deep-rooted fear of squids. I absolutely hated squids. I remember opening a book at the library with two scale images of different animals and saw the eye of a giant squid fill up the entire double page and realized they're even worse than Mario made me think. Surely we're going to have to solve the giant squid problem. I'm kind of surprised I can remember this moment because I have a not great memory. I don't remember most of my childhood or even much more than a couple years ago. Of the memories I've managed to keep, most of them are attached to video games. When I return to Mario Sunshine, I could feel the memories flood back into me. Memories from my childhood, not just the game, were unlocked because of their association with Isle Delfino. Some might hear this as kind of a pathetic reality, or call me a liar, you'll have to trust me on this, I wish I was lying. I can tell you roughly when my pet rabbit died, but only because Animal Crossing 3DS was announced the same week. I can tell you without checking that Paper Mario Sticker Star released on November 11th, 2012, exactly a year after Skyrim, but I can't tell you when I had my first kiss because somehow, Sticker Star was more memorable. It took me weeks to beat the Manta Storm boss on Serena Beach, so when I finally overcame it, I was so proud of myself that I went to Microsoft Word and tried to write a walkthrough, which I'm just now realizing was my first work of video game journalism. It's been lost to time, but here's my rough estimation of what that looked like. Sunshine is overall a great, deeply but sort of pleasantly flawed game. It's obvious to even a kid that it had a rush development with some wild design choices, glitches that are easy to discover, and a finale that is playable? If only Nintendo allowed it more development time or released it in the modern era with post-release patches, I think it's possible Sunshine could have been remembered as fondly as 64. The Mario franchise went completely silent until 2007 with the release of Super Mario Galaxy. Wait, wait, not yet! Oh! I wish I could say I knew from the first moments of seeing Splatoon in 2014 that it was something extraordinary, but what happened was I saw this cartoon squid, my fight or flight response activated, and I stepped away from Nintendo's best E3 presentation to get a drink. That new Zelda sure looks good. It wasn't until I saw people on the show floor who were playing it and hyping it up that I started to pay attention. It was the star of the show. It was something extraordinary. I was hyped, and I was a bored teenager, so I obsessed over every scrap of information available as I waited for what felt like a lifetime. The month before the game's release, the Splatoon Global Test Fire was held, and I savored every second. It was love at second sight. That was unironically the most formative moment for me for not judging new things on first impressions. This was Splatoon, Nintendo's very Nintendo take on competitive third-person shooters, featuring squids that turn into kids in a fresh, colorful, flourishing post-apocalyptic Earth. After ignoring climate change and doing a little bit of nuclear war, humankind sealed their fate and sea levels rose to the point of setting most life on land into extinction. Humanity's data was sent to a secure server on the moon. Oh, Wrong game. As they clung on their last scrap of life, various groups tried to preserve themselves, including a professor who created an advanced AI inside of a telephone to store humanity's knowledge and placed his cat into a cryogenic capsule. 10,000 years later, the water levels started to recede and marine life evolved to live on land. Squids began to resemble inklings and octopuses evolved into octolings and octarians. After forming their own intelligence over a couple thousand years, inklings developed their own sports, culture, and technologies powered by zapfish. Sea levels started to rise again and the dominating species of inklings and octolings declared war over the remaining land. Commencing, the Great Turf War. One inkling named Craig Cuttlefish formed the Squidbeak Splatoon to rival the great octo weapons built by Octarians. Domination was all but confirmed for the Octos until something got unplugged by accident, deactivating all of their weapons. What? It happens. This led to a decisive victory for the Inklings and ultimately sent all of Octokind into hiding. Inkling historical revisionists later claimed that their two extra limbs were responsible for their superiority. Shortly after, Inklings revived Turf Wars as a competitive sport, judged by Judd, seeming to be the lone surviving mammal. Turf War is Splatoon at its rawest form. Splatoon is the final evolution of area control. Splatoon is a shooter with the game feel of a platformer. Splatoon is better than you think. Even if you think it's good, it's better. It's better than I think. Splatoon is perfectly 
underdesigned. Inklings are humanoids with ink weapons that can instantly transform into squids. The human form can use weapons, but they run slow. Squid form is fast, stealthy, and vulnerable. With this, Splatoon manages to bear startlingly complex mechanical depth through only two primary actions, squid and kit. It's easy to understand for even a person touching a controller for the first time for several reasons. First off, Splatoon is a lot like a conversation. You are always either speaking or listening. The intuitive balance between kid and squid tricks a first-time player into thinking they know how to act in every situation. Second, ink is more readable than bullets. It's simultaneously a built-in firing indicator and a territory control interface. When shots are being fired, it's obvious where both the source and destination are. Nobody needs a tutorial to tell you that this area is this team's and that area is that team's. Colorblind people, I'm so sorry. Third, everything contributes to everything. In most shooters, landing damage shots is everything, so good aim is a requirement for contributing to the team. In Splatoon, the default mode of Turf War asks you to miss almost every shot since the objective is to get as much ink on the board as possible. And even in the competitive modes, inking territory can be just as important for domination as getting kills making a player with bad aim act as the support role by accident. Every missed offensive shot immediately becomes defensive area control. Area control means better mobility. More mobility is more verticality, speed, stealth, and reloads more shots to control more area. Every mechanic has inherent synergy with every other, within a push and pull between kid and squid just as the battle plays out with two colors trying to overwhelm each other in a map-wide tug of war. This interconnected, naturally understandable design works to an extreme because a single shot can kill opponents, score points, create defensive cover, aid verticality, deploy an enemy hazard, act as area denial, enhance team mobility, and place reload shots since the player's ink ammo is refilled automatically when swimming between encounters. It's both a perfect introductory shooter and one of the most competitively interesting games ever made. A lot of games would require flooding the player with varyingly connected and disconnected mechanics to achieve the same level of depth. Splatoon refuses. Because of this, the game inherently solves some of the genre's fun-reducing problems. Less is genuinely more. Much of the visual design of Splatoon is used to communicate with the player through feel. There are no health bars, just ink invading the edges of the screen and covering up the player. Taking damage overwhelms the player with the opponent's ink, becoming increasingly intrusive as your mobility is taken away and you feel the urgency to escape or splat the enemy. There's such an obvious, subconscious feeling of control the more ink you have on the board, visually and mechanically. The game convinces you that your color equals safe color, even if it was the mean enemy color in the previous match only 5 minutes ago. One of the most enjoyable parts of Splatoon's gameplay is how there's almost no downtime since every action feels significant. No waiting for opponents for action to start or jogging around a large map. Areas are dense and tightly packed, so downtime is reserved exclusively as a punishment for death. One of the secondary actions, the super jump, exists to get the player back to combat as soon as possible, while also having a defensive use case like everything else. Even though Splatoon's genius gameplay could have single-handedly carried the franchise into prominence, I think it would have struggled to reach the level that it has without its unique control scheme. It popularized the use of gyro aiming in console shooters, which will probably go down as the largest evolution in video game control since the joystick. Basically, Splatoon 1 used the Wii U gamepad's gyroscope combined with the control stick to allow fine-tuning aim and instant 360 degree shots to enable fast-paced action gameplay with just minor tilts. It bridges the gap between console and PC shooters, allowing controllers to approach the level of precision done with a mouse. This is kind of the most controversial aspect of Splatoon. I'm not even going to go to the defense of gyro aiming because thousands of people have done it before, and it's just an objective fact that it's better than using sticks alone. I'll also take this opportunity to say I love the gamepad. It's great. It's comfortable and stuffed full of fun. I love it. I miss it. The console is a decade old now, which means the people who play Nintendo Land in high school are now prominent on the internet. Internet, so get used to hearing this. Dual screen home console gaming was a good idea. I will forever be kind of resentful that Nintendo botched the marketing and doomed it from the start, but without the Wii U being the Wii U, we wouldn't have Splatoon. Splatoon is definitively a product of the Wii U. I think all of Nintendo's most creative ideas have been born out of desperation. The GameCube and Wii U, both commercial failures, had some of the most unique exclusive libraries because of this. Game companies are always going to go into overdrive when they're not allowed to be complacent. That's just our reality. We'll get way further into that later. Splatoon is fascinating because the genius of its central mechanic feels so obvious. Like, yeah, they shoot ink, so obviously they're a squid, so they can be a squid and surf and turf. But it's an idea that evolved a lot to get to this point. They don't teach this in schools anymore, but squids first evolved from tofu. Very fitting since one of the earliest prototypes for Splatoon featured blocks of tofu fighting to ink the most ground. The goal was to create a fully new game where the function came first and the form could be set later, and it was to be distinct from previous IPs. No Marios or Zeldas. Not even Mario Sunshine, because people at Nintendo literally forgot it existed. Mario was on the table as a last resort, but they tried a bunch of different humanoid prototypes like these rabbits that seemed to be pretty close to being final. Of course, they eventually discovered squids were a perfect fit for a game about shooting ink, establishing the basis for their big new third-person shooter. They created a variety of weapons, spent months balancing them, developed its unique fashion and punk retro-modern aesthetic, built up stages and this wide world of squid stories that would reveal itself in the single-player section of the game, Octo Valley. 
Splatoon single player is essentially a Mario Galaxy-like spiritual GameCube action platforming adventure because the Wii U was the vengeful zombified spirit of the GameCube. Each level is an abstract obstacle course that teaches players its online mechanics in a low-stress environment, and takes the protagonist Agent 3 through a journey to defeat the surviving Octo inhabitants that were forced into this valley by the Inklings. Octolings were created as the Warriors to the Inklings Marios, war soldiers trained from childhood living within the oppressive Octarian society. At this point, there was a lot of mystery around the Octolings, both in the story and their possibility of entering the multi player because of what unused data hinted at. For now, they and the rest of the Octarians are working under DJ Octavio, who stole the Zapfish to create better Octa weapons and get revenge on the Inklings for what they did to his people. He's so silly. Captain Cuttlefish from the Squidbeak Splatoon in the Great Turf War employed Agent 3 and his granddaughters, Callie and Marie, the Squid Sisters, forming the new Squidbeak Splatoon, who eventually had to save Cuttlefish himself after he was squidnapped by Octavio. It climaxes with this lengthy boss fight where the Squid Sisters break out the song that changed everything, Calamari Incantation, somehow managing to free the souls of the Octolings rescue Captain Cuttlefish, and return the Grey Zapfish to Inkopolis. I remember back then, I thought this battle was really incredible. It didn't really hit the same replaying it today. It's still really fun and well made, I just remember it feeling more. I guess I was just a kid with a lower bar and a greater capacity for being blown away. The Squid Sisters' voices were not only powerful enough to save the world, but to inform it of the daily news. The cousins, not actually sisters, rose to fame in their childhoods, leading into an early spotlight. In Splatoon 1, they were the biggest idol duo of Inkopolis, so they had the responsibility of hosting Inkopolis news to tell players about the updates, the current maps and modes that rotate throughout the day, and most importantly, the Splatfests. Splatfest culture lies deep within the heart of Splatoon. Almost every month during the life of the games, there's a weekend where players pick a side and battle it out to decide which option is legally better. It's usually simple stuff like cats versus dogs, arts versus science, pancakes versus waffles, though there has been some sponsored Splatfests like Autobots versus Decepticons and SpongeBob versus Patrick, and some more significant ones that we'll talk about soon. These live events are so emblematic to the whole of Splatoon's world in more ways than one. It's a space that is trying so hard and succeeding to feel like it's existing in real time. After watching the unskippable Squid sister's news segment, you were dropped into Inkopolis, surrounded by your fellow Inklings and their Miiverse thought bubbles, immediately making the world feel lived in. Like, you lived in it. When I look at this extremely walkable city of Inkopolis that was unique to Splatoon 1, it reminds me that I think there's a tendency to assume each Splatoon game replaces the last, which is mostly untrue. These games exist as independent entries and they all deserve a place in history just as much as Mario 64, Sunshine, Galaxy. Not just the story mode, which is more obvious, but every part of Splatoon 1 still is and feels different from its successors. Its unique Uniquely messy balance with overpowered special weapons and gear is not great for competitive play, but it's still undeniably endearing, and still fun. It's as if the in-world regulators were still trying to figure out if turning into a mythological horror should be legal or not. Surely we're going to have to solve the giant squid problem. It's noticeable in the graphics and some of the content that the budget wasn't all there for such an untested new thing, but they still had so much figured out from the start, which was essential to pulling off that lived-in feel. Every character has an interesting, unique personality and seems like they belong in this world's history. Callie and Marie's daily banter could be really fun and self-aware, being a rare instance where putting memes into a game didn't feel out of place. The shopkeepers too each represent a subgroup of this imaginary culture and sell fashion accessories that are all from specific brands, meticulously designed in a way that you can get familiar with enough to just look at a piece and know it's from Firefin, Zinc, or Crackon. You can tell the writers and localization team either had the time of their life making Splatoon or possibly the hardest job of their careers because almost everything in this game is a marine pun. The name of this mall in Inkopolis is Booyah Base, for the fish suit Booyah Base, the inkling call it Booyah, and Shibuya from The World Ends With You. The weapon job is Ammo Knights, like Ammo Knights and Ammo. And Knights, it's run by Sheldon, a horseshoe crab. He has a shell. Jellyfresh is run by a jellyfish. Shellafresh is run by a lobster named Bisque and might imply the existence of Squid Hell. Annie and Moe run the hat shop, a play on Anemone. A crustacean named Krusty Sean sells shoes in Splatoon 1 and food in the crust bucket in Splatoon 2. Spike is a sea urchin and a street urchin. Callie and Marie are calamari, fried squid. Their French names are Ao and Oli, Aoli. Big Man is a manta ray man. Shiver and Fry are groups of sharks and eels. Judd is the judge. In Japanese, he's Judge Coon. Sea Cucumber... is a sea cucumber. The killer whale is a high-pitched whale from a speaker and an endangered species. Squid beacons are beacons, and squids have beaks. My favorite weapon in the entire series, the poorly named angle shooter, comes from angle shooting, which is a behavior that is technically not cheating, but considered unethical. E-Leader is an elite gas pump weapon with the best capacity tank, so it's named after the metric volume measurement. Bamboozler is a play on getting bamboozled and it being a bamboo shoot. The GooTuber's Japanese name is SoyTuber, which I can only imagine is an in-world insult for inkling content creators. Splatlings are splat gatlings. Tetra is a fish, and the numerical prefix 
its meaning four. The Tetradulis can dodge four times. The Stingray is a ray gun that stings and is also a pun on Stingray. Tenta missiles is obvious, tentacle missiles, but it also fires ten missiles. The Tentabrella is similar, but it's also a tent. The Rainmaker is a powerful weapon modeled after the Shachi Hoko from Japanese folklore, an animal with a tiger head and a carved body that was believed to bring rainfall. The Japanese name is a play on Hoko and battle. In French, Dutch, and Italian, it's the Bazookarp. In German, the mode is Operation Goldfish. Black Belly Skate Park is named after the Black Belly Skate. Arowana is a fish, Moray is a eel. Bluefin is a tuna, Alfonsino is a tropical fish, as is Mahi Mahi. Anchovy Games references anchovies. Muscle Forge Fitness is where Inklings forge muscle, a homophone of muscle. New Albacore Hotel is likely a reference to the New Albany Hotel, and Albacore is a tuna. Wahoo World is named for what people scream at amusement parks, and the Wahoo Fish. Hagglefish Market is a play on the hagfish and haggling at a market. Sockeye Station is named after the salmon. Gone Fission Hydro Plant is a play on Gone Fission and Nuclear Fission. Even the game's name is a double pun. Splat, Platoon, Toon, Splatoon. See? <clears throat> Splatfests acted as the bow neatly tying together all of Splatoon's world feel by regularly pulling players back in for the year of Splatoon's life. Every month, when the Squid Sisters loudly forced the world to pick a side, it truly felt like a big event, like a celebration of Splatoon's existence right from the start. Climaxing with the first Splatfest to end all Splatfests, Cali vs. Marie. Not that deciding pineapple on pizza to be disgusting and grinding the gym to be better than grinding capitalism weren't of life-altering importance, this was the first Splatfest to have consequences, and democracy came out on top. While not super obvious, if you were unfortunate enough to be plugged into Wii U news at the time, it seemed like there was probably a Splatoon sequel in production for the next console, and Marie's victory would probably impact it. They even later confirmed that they wanted to headline the Splatfest with Your Choice Will Change the Next Splatoon, but they couldn't just announce a next-gen sequel during a Splatoon event before next-gen was even announced. Instead, after Marie claimed victory, the Squid Sister stories revealed that the Splatfest skyrocketed their careers, driving the two apart as they found their own success. Not long after, Kali disappeared, and so did the Wii U. And the Great Zapfish, again. This was Splatoon 2. I actually haven't gotten to play this one yet, but I've heard really good things. Just kidding. Splatoon worked. It proved itself, and it seems like Nintendo knew they struck gold. To headline the Switch's launch, Splatoon got a big, full sequel after only two years with a noticeable leap in quality. It got new weapons with the dodge ruling dualies and the defensive brellas, old weapons were upgraded with new capabilities like chargers storing shots and rollers getting a ranged attack, the broken special weapons were all replaced, many stages returned alongside a bunch of new ones, Inklings looked fresh with more than one hairstyle, it introduced a PvE zombie horde mode called Salmon Run, a bigger story campaign, and a new Inkling idol duo, Off the Hook though something seems off about this Inkling's hair. It was a refinement of what worked so well on the Wii U, just this time that quality increase really enabled Splatoon to start becoming into itself. Bigger budget, more culture, bigger confidence, more style. There's no better showcase of this and the entire company's heel turn at the time than how over the course of one year they went from this Rated everyone 10 and up. to this. Because Splatoon was no longer shackled to the Wii U, it was finally able to get into the cultural spotlight. I think a lot of people who don't live in Japan still don't fully grasp how massive Splatoon is. Splatoon 1 sold around 5 million on a console that sold 13.5 million. That's almost 40%. It was the single best-selling Wii U game in Japan. This was a new IP. There are Mario games on this thing. That's unreal. The second game in this franchise that was only 2 years old then sold 13 million. Halo 3, one of the most hyped blockbuster video game releases of all time, sold 14 million. Super Mario 64? Sunshine and Galaxy all sold less than Splatoon 2. And while we're not there yet, Splatoon 3 has already sold 8 million in 2 months. It's the fastest selling game ever in Japan. By the time you're watching this, it might have already outsold too. It's kind of a big deal, is what I would say if this was 2016. It's the biggest deal. Most games don't immediately become more important to their companies than franchises that have been going for decades. Splatoon's relevance hasn't been fully felt outside of Japan, but over there it's a cultural touchstone nearly on the level of Pokemon. I think the approachable learning curve designed into the game is a big factor in this, considering how the intense work culture in the country leaves people with not a lot of time to invest into demanding games, and Splatoon is loaded with appeal that goes well beyond gameplay. Its unique fusion of synth, EDM, techno, punk, rock, metal, pop, hip-hop, chiptune, jazz, and squid vocaloids in its music, all contextualized by a diverse in-world music scene, has captured the hearts of fans so much so that there are even live holographic concerts where the idols perform in front of crowds in Japan. Splatoon's music is so hyper-realized and well-developed, adding another layer onto the world immersion. The range of sounds is astonishing. I hate to have filler time, but I just have to show you a taste of it, so feel free to skip ahead if you don't care to hear.
Once you've heard enough songs across the franchise, you start to recognize which hits are from which bands and maybe develop favors without even realizing, all while just driving the objective. There aren't a lot of games with such substantial world building hidden in the background music. I love it. It cannot be understated what an Achievement Splatoon soundtrack is and how important it is for its global appeal. While not anything close to dominating, Splatoon has even seen growing successes in eSport. There's a healthy grassroots competitive scene that has gotten some support from Nintendo. Not a lot, not anything like it could be, but it's better than what Smash gets from them. Though I guess anything is better than the high bar of less than nothing. Do not humanize Nintendo. They are not your friend. Wait, let me try that again. They are not your friend. They are my friend. Something I haven't fully mentioned so far is that I was pretty good at this game. Not seriously competing or anything, but I was max rank at Splatoon 1 and usually high rank X in Splatoon 2. While I loved Splatoon and let it consume years of my life, Splatoon 2 and its competitive modes did it even more. I was good because I had all the time in the world and there was a lot more to do in Splatoon 2. All the ranked modes returned from the first game. Splat Zones, a self-explanatory area capture mode. Tower Control, where you ride the payload to the enemy's base. And Rainmaker, reverse capture the flag where the flag is an overpowered fish gun. And eventually the most unique ranked mode was added. Blitz. It probably has the most complex rule set of anything in the game, requiring the most teamwork and individual effort to collect clams spread around the map, convert them into soccer slash footballs, and break into a floating goal. This mode is awesome. I assume everyone loves it. Salmon Run was the big headliner, since it was Splatoon's first cooperative experience, where my teammates cooperate with the Salmonids to make us lose as fast as possible. Grizzco Industries, run by the mysterious Mr. Grizz, figured out that child labor was profitable, deploying Inklings into a zombie horde mode where you have to harvest golden eggs from boss Salmonids and take them to a basket to meet the quota. The whole atmosphere is overtly shady, with illegal weapons, dangerous working conditions, its vague recruitment commercial, and a boss that wouldn't show his face, but they made sweatshop labor really fun. Salmon Run was a great addition, because it was the third major pillar of the experience that tied in with both the PvE single player and PvP multiplayer, sort of bridging the gap between them. Your labor was compensated with useful multiplayer items, and Grisco's place in the world was unique for having almost no direct story relevance, but the environmental storytelling and world building was such a big curiosity that kept expanding throughout the game's updates. Who is Mr. Grizz? There's no way he's just a bear. Besides Judd, the mammals are dead. Bears aren't even real, I've never seen one. Maybe it's Judd behind it. Cats like eating fish, it makes sense. Lil Judd was added with little explanation, maybe he's the real Mr. Grizz. Or maybe it's just an inkling behind the radio. No Nobody knew. Later on, they introduced the final location in Salmon Run, Ruins of Arc Polaris, featuring a wrecked spaceship, signs in human English warning about bears, and real bear tracks. Just a whole lot of space bear imagery. Without explicitly saying it, the stage was confirming Mr. Grizz to be a bear. It was gentle storytelling perfect for multiplayer mode while clearly setting up for something bigger to come. And in the single player story mode itself, Splatoon's narrative continued, two years after Murray's victory. Since it was a follow up to a Wii U game, the story tried to balance this line between proper sequel and appealing to newcomers, not dissimilar to Mario Galaxy 1 and 2. Because of this, it sort of felt like it was an enhanced retelling of the first game while still moving the story forward. DJ Octavio escaped his snow globe prison while Cuttlefish and Agent 3 were supposedly on vacation. Marie discovers this, so on her quest to find her missing cousin and the Great Zapfish, she grabs a player from Ingopolis Square to play the role of Agent 4. They run through the missions in Octo Canyon, which play very similarly to Octo Valley, just with a handful of new mechanics, and stages are now designed to use all of the weapon types, not just shooters. It's more of a good thing. It's great. At its climax, the Squidbeak Splatoon finds Cali siding with the Octarians. The new Octavio fight was was just a lesser version of the original. To accommodate for the new variety of weapons, they reduced the big exciting chase sequence to just this small arena. It's not bad, the whole presentation and musical buildup was awesome, it was just a massive disappointment for it to not top what Splatoon 1 did. Bomb Rush Blush makes up for it though. Marie saved Callie from Octavio's brainwashing and Agent 4 finished him off with the Rainmaker as the Squid Sisters reunited. The Great Zapfish was saved once again and Octavio was back in his ball, but wait, 
What's up with those new idols? Splatoon 2's story was concluded and Off the Hook is still a mystery. It was self-aware about it too. There were lots of lines alluding to Marina being special and pretty much everyone put four and four together to realize she was an Octoling. Off the Hook was a lot like Mr. Grizz for a while, just this obviously story relevant thing that wasn't expanded on. Until about a year after launch, the Splatoon team dropped one of the best DLCs to ever bless a video game, the Octo Expansion. This was a completely new story campaign with a dramatic shift away from the style of the first two and a new vaporwave aesthetic. And it took place at the same time as Octo Canyon, tying up pretty much every loose thread in character stories and laid the groundwork for the future of the franchise. When Calamari Incantation freed the Octolings, Marina was among them, allowing her to free from the army into Inkling society. This is where she met Pearl, a young musician from a rich family trying to start her music career. They immediately bonded and Pearl taught Marina everything about Inkopolis, not fully realizing she was an Octoling. They formed Off the Hook, their first single was a hit, and they grew popular enough to replace the Squid Sisters in Inkopolis news. This was all uncovered in leaked Twitter DMs between myself and Hasashi Nogami. In Marina's chat room, a series of logs revealing Off the Hook's backstory, unlockable by completing sections of the adventure. Turns out this was the vacation that Captain Cuttlefish and Agent 3 were on. Deep in the Inkopolis underground, Cuttlefish was trapped in a testing facility called the Deep Sea Metro. He bumps into a recently saved Octoling, humming the incantation, and recruits them as Agent 8. He doesn't see species. Shortly after, they run into a talking telephone, telling them how the subway system will get them to the promised land, presumed to be the surface. All they have to do is pass a series of tests given by the conductor, Sea Cucumber, and gather four things, and the door to the promised land will open. It couldn't be more simple, and Off the Hook was there on the radio to help out. These challenges were so much better than anything the series had before. To me, this was a turning point where Splatoon finally ascended. The sheer variety present here is unheard of. Every level has some big new idea or remixes old ideas in interesting ways, keeping a fast moving pace the entire time that is only enhanced by an even more interesting, rapidly unfolding story about humanizing the ongoing villains of the series. It's a package that could easily be considered not only a perfect video game expansion, but one of the most refined adventures Nintendo has ever put out. This was the Splatoon team finally showing what they were capable of and what Splatoon could be when allowed to exist without training wheels. Splatoon's lore has always had dark undertones, just now they weren't subtle about it. After collecting the things, the parts assemble into the Promised Land, a giant blender in which the telephone tries to use Agent 8 and Cuttlefish as ingredients in his DNA smoothie made from the 10,007 test subjects that came before. At the last moment, Agent 3 jumps in to save them and Agent 8 begins the escape. The climax here is a sequence that makes Octo Valley look like a tech demo. 8 works their way through stealth, combat, platforming, and puzzle sections up to the surface, backed by some of the best music in the series, until again running into Agent 3, now with their mind hijacked by the telephone. If you played Splatoon 1, this fight was a little surreal and surprisingly impactful. You were essentially fighting your past self, and the music they chose for the boss is a remix of the first and most iconic song from Splatoon 1, Splatack. This isn't an emotional song by any means, but it's impossible to separate it from that moment of the Inkling's debut in Memories of the Old Game. It was kind of the first time that Splatoon showed it was nostalgic towards itself, and this was the Octo expansion legitimizing Agent 3 as an actual important character, not just a player avatar. Later that year, they were in Smash Bros. After saving Agent 3, Agent 8 takes a massive leap for Octokind, ready to join Marina as an Octoling living in Ingopolis, until Commander Tartar comes in. When the professor who froze Judd created this telephone, he intended for it to pass on knowledge about humanity's failures to prevent new life from making the same mistakes, but it got lonely after 12,000 years and decided to do a little genocide to create the ultimate life form born from his primordial smoothie. In an effort to destroy Ingopolis and restart the world in his vision, he armed this giant Greek statue with his smoothie rocket, but Agent 8 cut Cuttlefish, Marina, and Pearl defeated it with the power of Turf Wars and loud friendship. Finishing the story unlocked Octoling player types in the multiplayer, signaling the welcoming of Octos into squid culture… kinda. It seems like the Inklings just thought that the Octolings were Inklings with different hairstyles, or maybe they were just pretending? Most Inklings had never seen Octolings before, so I guess it's possible they were just totally oblivious. To be as welcoming as possible to the newcomers, the Splatfest gods did what anyone would do, make them fight. The first anniversary Splatfest was Squid vs Octopus, Species vs Species. In universe, a Splatfest team winner is considered legally superior. One of these teams was historically oppressed. It's not what I would choose for a welcome party, but pretend war is all that Inklings know. Really, it's kind of sweet. Tartar criticized Inklings for waging war over minor genetic deviations and obsessing over trivial fashion choices. They have and they do, but now they recognize the silliness of it all and they celebrate their differences through the culture of Splatfests. They didn't need Tartar's knowledge to be better than us. Splatfest results are trivial, it doesn't actually matter who wins, just like every battle within them and every ranked battle you lose your mind over rather than just having fun. Splatfests are everything and nothing, and they continued on after Squids took their 10 tentacled victory until finally, the last Splatfest ever. 
The Splatocalypse was to be the final and biggest Splatfest of Splatoon 2, Chaos vs. Order. But they put it all on the line, do you want a world of change and variety, or safety and assurance? I lied 20 seconds ago. Like Cali vs. Murray, this one did matter. The winning team would decide the future of Splatoon, the theme of Splatoon 3. They made sure to make this one feel different from the rest. Inkopolis was growing with apocalyptic decor, it was three days long with new music, special songs playing during each day, characters were revealed to be aligned with each side, every unique shifty station was playable, even including a new one where Pearl and Marina joined the battle. Splatoon 2 couldn't have gone out in a better way. It was an event with such an aura of importance that it made other Splatfests look lacking in comparison. On one of the days of the final fest, I was at a mall with some friends and we walked into an empty candy store. The guy at the counter first said, your kind aren't welcome here. My first thought was, how can he tell my friend is gay? I looked down, remembered I was wearing a team order shirt, and realized that other people exist that play Splatoon. Chaos is going to win, he said. He was right. This is Splatoon. Five years after the sequel, the Squid Game got its threequel, the end of the trilogy. And I don't know about anyone else, but the length of time between these three releases felt identical, even though one was over twice as long. Splatoon 3 is the final form of everything it knew it could be in 2015. It's the kind of follow-up that was first criticized as something that could have been DLC, but will someday be looked back on as the Dragon Quest 3 moment of the franchise. Because of its competitive nature, it's hard to make changes to the core gameplay without ruining what's there. Splatoon 2 played mostly identically to 1, and 3 seems the same on the surface, but has introduced some advanced tech that makes it hard to go back, the best thing a sequel can do. Squid Roll and Squid Surge are new options in Squid Mode that, when mastered, add defensive options to the form that has always been the most vulnerable and introduce even more speed. Squid Roll feels like it has lubricated Splatoon, and has added a higher skill curve to movement itself. Anyone can do it, but it becomes obvious at higher levels that this dodge has completely changed the way it's played. It's like if Melee had existed twice but didn't get wave dashing until the third time. Stylistically, Splatoon 3 has seen a major shift, as this is the first game to take place outside of Inkopolis. This is Splatsville, the city of chaos in the heart of the Splatlands. It's messy. I still don't know where all the shops are. I got lost looking for the new table turf battles. It's a stunning mishmash of culture and inspiration that's emblematic to the whole of the game. I was on team order and I'm glad we lost. Deep Cut is the new idol group, this time a trio, Shiver, Fry, and Big Man, inspired by traditional Japanese, Indian, and Brazilian cultures. These elements are seen in their designs and even their distinct musical styles. You can hear it especially in their Splatfest theme, Anarchy Rainbow, with instrumentation and vocals influenced from their respective parts of human society. The full embrace of chaos on display here has added so much flavor on top of the already vibrant style of the previous games. They could have easily taken Chaos in the apocalyptic direction, but instead it feels like a doubling down on what made Splatoon so special. Somehow the entry that takes place in a giant wasteland is the most colorful game yet. You can still go to locations near Inkopolis though. The range of stages new and old are all across Inkadia and the Splatlands with natural changes since the last time we visited. Hammerhead Bridge's construction is complete. The prices are higher at Mako Mart. Flounder Heights is more eco-friendly. The new weapons here feel very much built in the Splatlands. Stringers, a class of flexible bows, and Splatanas, Splat katanas. They're cool. At this point, they can turn anything to a weapon, and it makes sense, so I'll gladly take stamp chainsaws. One of the most significant additions here is the new progression system and collectibles. I love it. I love running out of in-game currency, especially when there's no way to buy it with real-world currency. I'm serious. In an industry where the battle pass has become more normalized than gambling, it's refreshing to see it attempted in a player-friendly way. There's so much to collect, and it's all free. Who knew this was still allowed? As you level up, you're also contributing to the catalog level, providing a constant stream of new stuff to keep you coming back. Everything from clothing, gear, food tickets, money, and the huge new range of collectible trinkets. These are stickers, posters, books, figures, cereal boxes, mugs, plushies, trophies, anything you might want to put into your new customizable lockers. It's basically a mini Animal Crossing. The next step is to just add full customizable apartments. Do you really want that though? With apartments comes rent, and landlords. F**k landlords. Landlords. Really, it's just a travesty. They added lockers with no option to shove my salmon run teammates into them. With the better unlockables in Splatoon 3 making it even more Animal Crossing a fight, it's really forming deeper into that lifestyle game, especially with how it's the third entry and time is still passing the same. Previously, I've touched on the intention behind Animal Crossing's annoying design choices. They've drifted into Splatoon since the start, which makes sense because it's the same people working on these two franchises. I'm sorry, but talking about good bad game design is kind of secretly my thing. In the first two games, the unskippable news segments were undeniably Animal Crossing design. Design, forcing you to experience the live news slowly convinced you that the world was real and that you were a fan of the Squid Sisters whether you liked it or not. In Splatoon 3, Deep Cut can be skipped because other lifestyle game aspects have been heightened so there's less need for such a relatively cheap trick. You're probably going to end up caring less overall about the members of Deep Cut, but now you can quickly queue into a match and see your teammates in the training room. What it really means calling Splatoon a lifestyle game is that it wants you to fit it into your life. It wants you to care deeply about expressing yourself through your avatar, your locker, your photos, your splash tag. They want Splatfest to make you argue with your friends. They want updates 
updates to keep you coming back and getting better, unlocking new items every time you turn on the game. New stages, weapons, and styles freshen up battles every few months. Some don't like the slow rollout of content in games like this. I think people need to consider it with more nuance. There's right ways to do it, and a lot more wrong ways to do it. Splatoon is a lot like a TV show on a seasonal schedule. Watching each episode as it releases over the years is a better experience than binging it once it's done. A base game that feels comparatively empty at launch and having this trickle of content probably does enhance the experience. If the final state of Splatoon 3 as it will exist in a few years was available on day one, it would make Splatoon bingeable, disposable, consumable. The only part you should be binging is the new story campaign, Return of the Mammalians. This is the new Agent 3, different from that Agent 3. They're a salvager in the scraplands. They have a salmonid small fry companion, cementing the franchise's place in the big friend little buddy genre popularized by The Last of Us, God of War, Death Stranding, Bayonetta 2. The story opens up seeming to be more of the same again. The great zapfish is gone and cuttlefish pulls you into the sewers to get it back. It looks like another Octo Valley, just with fuzzy ooze everywhere that little buddy has to clean up. After a few levels, it throws a curveball as Octavio comes in as the first boss fight. After beating him, you find out he didn't take the zapfish this time, and the fuzz overtakes the crater, sending them falling into the underground city of Alterna. It's a good moment. It will never not get me when a game winks at you by dropping the title card as it admits it lied to you. Because Cuttlefish was lost in the fall, new Agent 3 is immediately recruited to rescue him by the new new Squid Beak Splatoon, Callie, Marie, and the new Captain. Look at Agent 3. They're not a squid kid anymore. They're a big kid. An adult. Like me. And you. I'm pretty confident saying you watching this right now are an adult because only 1% of the viewers on this channel told YouTube that they're not, and the Splatoon player base is mostly young adults. Even if it was mostly teenagers seven years ago, the average age of a fan base generally goes up because fans keep being fans. And as the launch of something grows further into the past, it stops appealing as much to the new young people. Stuff that you associate as four kids probably stopped being primarily four kids a while ago. Minecraft, for instance, is played on average by 24 year olds. Nintendo in general is now enjoyed by an older population for the same reason. I don't even know. Know what kids are playing anymore. I guess Roblox? TikTok? It's possible that the For You page has decimated the attention span of some would-be JRPG evangelists. I was going to launch into a full-on jokingly serious critique of TikTok here, but I felt like it hurt the flow. But I already put effort into it, so if you want to watch that, I've made it available on the Patreon. Return of the Mammalians is effectively a bigger, better Octo expansion. Almost every level is optional, making this the least linear Splatoon adventure yet. It's sorta of open world, but not really. Alterna consists of a bunch of snowy islands with a rocket in the middle inside of a giant dome. Turns out that during the nuclear apocalypse, one of the human groups that survived the longest was hiding underground, and their scientists developed an AI called Orca to record their knowledge. Sound familiar? They lined the dome with giant squid-based liquid crystal panels that reflected human desires, making an artificial sky. The rocket was built to escape back to the surface, but there was a catastrophic failure that caused the colony to collapse. Shortly after, the crystals filled the surrounding water and got absorbed into all the marine life. Because of the recorded wishes of humanity in them, the crystals forced the sea creatures to rapidly evolve to be human-like and live on land, finally giving an explanation for why squids and jellyfish and everything else evolved to like people. In a way, the scientists' effort to pass on their legacy to new civilization was still successful. The levels here are absolutely the best in any of the campaigns so far. I'm safe saying that because some of them have a grapple hook. It leads into a final sequence and boss fight that marks the end of everything the Splatoon trilogy has been building up to since 2015. Remember Arc Polaris? It contained another group of old Earth survivors, intending to launch far into space to find a different planet. It took damage at the edge of the solar system and was forced to head back to Earth, but there was a major failure that caused it to take 10,000 years to drift towards the planet, and re-entry ended all hibernating life on the ark, except for one, a bear. He was a lone mammal in a world dominated by sea creatures and had built up knowledge after thousands of years that drove him to do something about it. It kinda seems like Splatoon considers loneliness to be the world's biggest threat. He discovered Alterna's liquid crystals and figured out how to combine them with his fur to create this fuzzy ooze that can turn all life into mammals. If he was to bring back mammals across the world, he would need a lot of help and a lot of golden eggs. So of course, he became an entrepreneur. This whole time, every salmon run shift done by the cephalopods has been fueling Mr. Grizz's plan, and now he had enough ooze loaded into the Alterna rocket to onset the return of the mammalians. On their way to save Cuddle, fish they find him dried out by Grizz and see his intentions and after years of mystery it's finally revealed to the player what Mr. Grizz is as he launches his plan and the Alterna rocket into space. With the help of Deep Cut, new Agent 3 follows right behind, beginning the final fight over the world. They get close enough to take Grizz down just as he blows up the rocket and inflates himself with the ooze to get the job done himself. A first for a CEO. Agent 3 is sent flying but saved by none other than DJ Octavio. They've got a common enemy now. Through his speakers, Deep Cut and the Squid Sisters come together to perform a new iteration of the Heavenly Melody. 
Calamari Incantation 3 mix. Small Fry transforms into Big Fry, and together, Agent 3, the Squid Sisters, Deep Cut, Big Fry, and DJ Octavio take down the Space Bear. This is everything. The incantation from Splatoon 1 has been taken to its limit, saving the entire world. The Octarians, the main villains of the franchise, were now one with the Inklings. The greatest mystery of Splatoon 2's Salmon Run has reached its climax, and one of the voiceless victims of Grisco Industries was able to fight back. This fight perfectly unites every ongoing cross-game plotline. It's the use of remixed music throughout the entire sequence that takes it to the next level, defeating this giant teddy bear's genuine emotional weight. This isn't the kind of story that will change your life or anything, it simply wants to be a part of it, and if you let it, it can still have a real impact. Mr. Grizz's fight feeling like a culmination and celebration of everything in a franchise that I largely associate with being a kid meant a lot to me because I don't really get that often. My favorite Mario game is the one that Nintendo tries to sweep under the rug. Most of my favorite games are part of long-running franchises that I wasn't there for at the start. Splatoon's soul is so powerful that everything it does in Return of the Mammalians feels instantly as iconic as some of the most nostalgic glazed video games. It's a combination of new and old that confidently states that Splatoon is one of the biggest things now. These characters here reflect the whole of Splatoon for me. From the first impression I was put off, but it grew on me almost instantly, just like Deep Cut. I think I saw these designs and couldn't help but feel it was a downgrade from the previous idols, but it's actually scary how quick they grew on me and made me a big fan after they revealed their motive to be wealth redistribution. They act as the bosses leading up to the Mr. Grizz, which combined with Octavio made each step towards the finale feel a lot more personal than the Octa weapons of previous games. Apparently one of the fastest ways to make players fall in love with characters is to turn them into exciting boss fights. Fry wields her eels, Shiver drives the shark, and Big Man transforms into the- wait. The Hype Manta Storm? Like, the Manta Storm? Manta Storm? Super Mario Sunshine is special because of its complete, unwavering commitment to being a fully realized space. It's a place you can go and just be in. Isle Delfino occupies a permanent space in my brain, just like Woohoo Island, like Garrick Mach Monastery, like the open world of Nier Automata, like the body of the Bionis. Proving that we're in the good timeline, Splatoon 3 confirms Splatoon to be the first of many follow-ups to Super Mario Sunshine. I was able to play through the campaign a few days early, so nobody was able to ruin this surprise for me. It rocked my world. They referenced Mario Sunshine in my yellow Splatoon game. It felt like a personal appeal to my nostalgia, just for me, no one else. Going back to Sunshine helped me realize that Splatoon is so much baked in the same magic of Sunshine, but taken to the natural next step. It didn't do this because it wanted to be like Sunshine specifically, it did it because the soul that Mario Sunshine shares with other games is extremely present. It's at the heart of what I love most in games, and ultimately what makes the medium my favorite thing. Splatoon has all of the same interconnected area design and chill factor in its world, and evolves the idea by adding a dimension of time. The fall the statue from Splatoon 2's Octo Expansion is visible from Splatoon 3's Hammerhead Bridge, now very different from the early construction form it took in Splatoon 1. This stage bridges the previous world of Incadia to the modern Splatlands. Inkopolis Tower is always visible in stages that are in places where it should be visible. It's a franchise spanning Delfino Plaza, in multiple ways since they're both even the hub worlds. When I went back to Splatoon 1 to play through the story again and see how the online looked in a post-Splatoon world, I opened up Inkopolis to be met with a sight of someone I had forgotten about. Me. I stood there, taking it all in, remembering myself, looking back, alone, surrounded by Inklings, without the voice of Miiverse, reliving what now feels like the petrified corpse of a time I thought I couldn't return to. I look at the first Inklings and can't help but remember exactly how I felt in 2015. They're just like me. I see them now and think, we really were kids now, then. I look at the Inklings and Octolings of today, standing taller and older and am proud of how much Splatoon has grown how much I've grown, but I still look back at them and see people that no longer exist, in a world that time abandoned and most players never even knew. That was the last time I will ever be that young. This is the last time I will ever be this young. When I see anyone say they miss Splatoon 1 as a slight on its successors, I know they don't really miss Strength Up, Defense Up, maybe they miss Squid Jump a little, but they don't miss Bubblers, they miss themselves. They miss their life during Splatoon. Unlike that fleeting moment in time itself, you can still return to this game. You can try to chase the same magic that nostalgia fogs your mind with, but it's little more than a freeze frame, stuck into a fading film of the Inklings world that has long since moved on, and it will inevitably be lost. For now, you can easily return to the past, but no one is there anymore. Why are you? The big difference between nostalgia for Splatoon and something like Mario is that Mario isn't a lifestyle game. Super Mario Sunshine will never be finished, but Splatoon 3 will. When ongoing or multiplayer experiences blur the line between life and video games, for some window of time, that game can kind of become your life. And that's okay. The nostalgia for Splatoon is so deeply intertwined with a time in the real world, so not only does it tug at your memories of your real past, it's a shared communal experience for everyone who's part of the game's lifespan. 2015, 2017, 2022. 
In 40 years, there will be a Splatoon game where Captain Agent 3 and the Squid Sisters are referenced as these old legendary characters, and none of the current players will have even been there for Callie vs. Marie. Something I wanted to mention before but held off until now was that it felt weird calling the characters in Xenoblade 3 kids. It wasn't a conscious decision, in my head they're just the Ouroboros kids. They're not even that much younger. It just made me realize that more and more games are going to become about people that seem like kids to me. People that would have seemed like my big cool friends a decade ago. Chrono was my big brother self with funny hair. Shane was my friend who I knew I could fix. Luigi was the uncle with a gambling addiction. Mio and Noah would have been people I looked up to, but instead they were relatable to my past self? As terrifying as it is to outgrow your favorite characters, there's still something beautiful about the permanence and immortality of that art, perfectly fitting for what Xenoblade 3 is. And there's something equally beautiful and exciting about a living, evolving franchise right there alongside you. I feel incredibly lucky for Splatoon releasing when it did, since the aging characters in this world are aging similarly aside me. It had been a decade since the last time Nintendo had debuted a big new IP, and when they finally did it again, the new characters were permanently close to my own age. Now, over 7 years after the release of Splatoon on the Wii U, the characters in Splatoon 3 have aged 7 years, just like me. And you. You're a kid now. You're squid now. You blink. And you're an adult now. The Splatoon 3 cephalopods don't really look like adults, but when confronted with the familiar stranger in the mirror, neither do I? I don't think. Maybe I do. I don't feel like one. I feel like me, trapped in what other people perceive that to be. Does the feeling of being a kid cosplaying as someone who knows what they're doing ever go away? Surely Captain Craig Cuttlefish doesn't feel the same. <laughs> Or maybe he does. The Inklings are still reenacting Turf Wars for fun, maybe not much has really changed in the past 7 years. Or more so, it's the constants in life that hold the most power amidst the chaos. I'm still sitting here on my bed shooting colorful goo out of washing machines, just now I rent my own washing machine. And I'm not as good at Splatoon. And Splatoon 3 is a much better game. I already experienced Splatoon 1. And Splatoon 2. I was there and there's no need to return. Or really, the unknowable part of me that is core to my identity and unfazed by time is who was really there. I'll always have those memories of rising up the ranks, playing the first Splatfests, facing DJ Octavio for the first time, paired with what was happening in my life at that moment. As easy as it is to romanticize a game that I will never fall out of love with, I know that Splatoon 3 is better. I've grown and the franchise has grown, into a titan of the industry. The Squid Sisters are almost as big of a deal to Nintendo as Super Mario, and I don't need to return to life 7 years ago, and I no longer hate squids. I wish I could resolve this with some grand revelation about becoming an adult, aging. I can't. It's agonizing. It's everything. It's agonizing like everything. Like saying goodbye, falling in love, stubbing your toe, graduating an era of life, bettering yourself, pushing the rainmaker, waiting for anything, waiting for waiting to stop? For some reason it's easier to accept that things end than it is to accept the gradual lead up to it. I guess they're so tightly interwoven that it's all or nothing? If there's beauty to be found at the inevitability of one absolute end, there's equal agonizing beauty to be found in constant endings, because change itself is neutral. It's only what you make of it. Likewise, the beauty in anything can be agonizing or satisfying. It just depends on how you look at it. Every year ends, and you'll never be as young as you were then again. Every day ends, never to repeat. Every friendship ends, every story, every game. Every Splatfest. Splatoon 3 will end. Someday it will be old, and so will you. Enjoy the bumpy ride. It's probably not as bad as anyone thinks. Evolution and change is the primary theme of Splatoon. It was born out of the desire to make something new, content updates change it constantly, and at its heart is a world interested in overcoming and learning from the past, celebrating its deep connection to humanity both in its distant future lore and the meta-narrative of it being a video game played by it, and its rebellious punk aesthetic. It makes sense for Inklings to want to dab, it makes sense for you to think it's cringe, and it'll make sense next year when Fry references something from pop culture that doesn't exist yet. I'm going to look back at this in a few years and see the footage and think, wow, Splatoon 3 was so different different back then, and I'm going to think the same about myself. We all change a lot. All we can do is revel in the unavoidable chaos. Splatoon as a franchise has grown up, and so have we.
Hey, if you made it here to the end, I cannot thank you enough for watching. Producing this video ended up being such a massive undertaking that I didn't expect, but I had to do it because I love this franchise. I love it a lot. Did I even mention that before? Do you love Splatoon? Tell me about it. This was my experience with the Splatoon franchise, and I genuinely would love to hear all about yours and how it has impacted everyone in different ways. And above all, thank you so much to my patrons who supported the creation of this video. They're the best, coolest people on this planet. Any support means the world, leaving a comment, a like, or sharing the video. But if you want to go above and beyond, the best thing you can do is joining the Patreon to help me continue to make videos like this and unlock access to the bonus content for this episode.